Hello. Uh, thank you, Anne, and thank you all for coming today and for inviting me here. It's, it's really a pleasure to be back in San Francisco and speaking with you. My, can everybody hear me okay? No. A little louder. How's that? Is that better? Okay. I hear an echo, but is it? It's okay? I know. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, welcome. I heard that your last talk was about canons, and today we're going to have a little bit of a more peaceful talk as we wander in gardens and try to forget about war and diplomacy and things like that. Uh, and we are going to be going into a garden created in the 18th century within the Forbidden City and designed and built and conceived of by the 18th century Emperor Chen Long. So let's begin our stroll through the garden. Uh, it is known uh, formally as the Tranquility and Longevity Palace Garden. But today, most people just call it the Qianlong Garden. Uh, and let's just talk a little bit about the Qianlong Emperor. I'm sure you are all very well versed uh, about this amazing emperor that really was the height of the Qing Dynasty. Uh, the Qianlong Emperor was born in 1711, and he passed away in 1799. He reigned for 60 years. As somebody once said to me, if you want to try to conceive of what a 60-year reign is, uh, think of John F. Kennedy, and if he had been president for 60 years, he'd still be president today. So it's a very long time. Uh, basically, the Qianlong Emperor was living at the same time period as George Washington, and amazingly, they both died in the same year, 1799. So that gives us a sense of where, where in the history of the world the Qianlong Emperor was. Now, the Qianlong Emperor occupied the Forbidden City in Beijing. Uh, during this time period in the 18th century. Now, many of you know that the Forbidden City became known as the Winter Palace as opposed to the Summer Palace. And many of the Qing emperors actually did not really enjoy being in the urban area of the Forbidden City. So they spent as little time as possible there. But they did need to be there in the winter time, which is why this became known as the Winter Palace. And why did they need to be there? They needed to be there at New Year's time, because there were certain rituals that the emperors had to perform in the Forbidden City at New Year's time. So uh, the Qianlong Emperor was always there at that time period. Now, we often think of the Qianlong Emperor as uh, a warrior, and he even called himself uh, the Emperor of the Ten Great Campaigns. He expanded China, uh, and he thought of himself as a, as a commander. And here is an image of him. Uh, it was painted by Giuseppe Castiglione, who was Italian and a missionary, uh, and had been trained in Italy and Milan uh, as a European-style painter, and where he painted murals for the churches in Italy. Uh, but at, one, at some point, he decided he really wanted to go to China and to go to China as a missionary. Uh, when when he got there and was trying to convince the Chinese emperors of Christianity and, and Catholicism, uh, they basically said to him, actually, we're not really interested in Catholicism, but you seem to be a very good painter. And so he, be <laughs> uh, he became a 
court artist in the Qianlong Emperor's court. And he was uh, the Qianlong Emperor's favorite artist. And you can see that what he did is he combined European and Chinese painting together. And so we, we have this wonderful example of a painting of the Qianlong Emperor. He did many portraits of the Qianlong Emperor. But you can see, for instance, in the metal uh, on his chest, that rounded metal object, the, the gleam of the light, which is something that would only have happened in European art and not in Chinese art at all. Um, so let's keep. Now, the Qianlong Emperor, as we know, the Qing Dynasty emperors were all Manchu. They were not Chinese. They were not Han Chinese. They tried to be Han Chinese, and they tried to show off their learning of Chinese uh, Confucian texts. But they were also very intent on maintaining their uh, Manchu customs. And so in this painting, we can see that the Qianlong Emperor um, was very into archery. That was a Manchu custom. He was also into horseback riding. And as well, uh, he was wearing a Manchu-style costume. So what is the Manchu-style costume? And what is the difference between Manchu costumes and Han Dynasty costumes? One of the main ways to tell the difference is in the sleeves. Um, you can see that the sleeves are very tight in the arms. And that made horseback riding much easier. So uh, you can see his his costume has those tight sleeves. And the Ming costumes had much more flowing sleeves. Um, the Qianlong Emperor was so into his Manchu culture that he insisted that anybody who spoke to him spoke to him in Manchu. So Castiglione not only had to learn Chinese and writing Chinese, he also had to learn Manchu in order to communicate with the emperor. So um, here is a map of China. And if you look at the green area there, that is the area that the Qianlong Emperor expanded um, the Chinese territory into. So that includes Xinjiang and Tibet. And if you wonder why the Chinese today say Xinjiang and Tibet were traditionally Chinese, it's really because the Qianlong Emperor expanded the borders of that time period. So he really was this very, and thought of himself as a military man. Um, but there was another side of the Qianlong Emperor. He was very interested in Chinese literati culture. And he thought of himself, and he presented himself as a Chinese literati. We see this image of him here, uh, wearing Chinese literati clothes, a scholar's, whoops, I'm sorry, a scholar's cap, and he's writing calligraphy. So as well as being this Manchu emperor, he really liked uh, to write Chinese poetry, he'd do calligraphy. In his lifetime, he wrote 40,000 Chinese poems. That's a lot of poems, if you think about it. Um, so he really liked to present himself as a Chinese literati. Uh, and we have wonderful images of the Qianlong Emperor in gardens because the garden was a really the home site of every Chinese literati. This is what they desired. They desired to be surrounded by nature and away from um, the, what they call the, the dust of the earth, the um, politics and things, day-to-day um, -day human relations. Uh, the ideal was to be in the mountains, but if you couldn't be in the mountains, you wanted to be in your garden. Uh, and this is a wonderful painting here. It's a mural. It's, uh, so if you imagine over on the right, that, that was a doorway 
So you can see how large this work was. And again, it was Trumploy, it was influenced by the Jesuits and Castiglione's painting styles. You can see there's a real three-dimensionality to it, but it's still a Chinese painting. And at the top, in the center, is a poem written by the Qianlong Emperor. Um, he, he fancied himself a, a fine calligrapher, though calligraphers today look at it, you know, look down on him. And they say his poetry is, was more, a, um, more about quantity than quality. But he tried, he tried, right? Um, so when the Qianlong Emperor turned 60 years old, he made a decision. He made a decision that he wanted to retire after reigning for 60 years. His grandfather, the Kangxi Emperor, had reigned for 61 years. And he said he didn't want to outdo his grandfather. He thought it would be respectful to his grandfather to retire after 60 years. So that was his plan. So in 1771, he decided to create a palace where he could retire after his 60 years of reign. And he called that the Tranquility and Longevity Palace. And it was to be specifically for his retirement. It was in the northeastern corner of the Forbidden City, that area there. Uh, and uh, some of you might have been in this area. Uh, it's known for its nine dragon screens, uh, beautiful palace buildings, as well as this wonderful piece of jade that's about mm, 10, 15 feet high uh, that the Qianlong Emperor had carved, had commissioned and carved. So, uh, in the northwest corner of this Tranquility and Longevity Palace was a garden. And this is the garden that we're going to be talking about today. And you can see it marked here in a red rectangle. Uh, and here it is just laid out. It's two acres. It has 26 buildings in it. When we think of Chinese gardens, we think primarily uh, that the primary uh, objects in the gardens were rockeries and buildings. European gardens, we think of flowers and plants and trees and bushes. But in a Chinese garden, most important were rocks, and after rocks were the architecture. So it was, it was more about having buildings within rockeries where you can rest and make believe that you are in the mountains. Uh, and the Qianlong Emperor once said, an emperor or king, when he is time before holding an audience or attending to the affairs of state, should have extensive grounds to stroll in and lovely vistas to enjoy. If he has such a place, he'll be able to cultivate his mind and refine his emotions. So the gardens that the Qianlong Emperor created, and this was not the first one, were really there for him to be alone and, as he says, cultivate his mind. Um, so let's, let's head into the garden. Um, but before we get there, we have to go through a variety of corridors and um, byways through this very urban environment of the Forbidden City. Um, and eventually we get to these doors. This is the entrance. On the left here is a plan of the garden, and I'm going to help you wander through the garden, take you through and, and see what the Qianlong Garden, uh, what the Qianlong Emperor created here. And remember, he really did design all of this. He designed the layout. He designed the concepts. Uh, we have many uh, writings that the, the emperor wrote specifically detailing uh, every uh, corner 
every name of every building that the Qianlong Emperor wrote. Um, so this is the main gate of the garden. And the Qianlong Emperor named every piece of architecture within the building. And each name has a historical reference and a poetic reference. And he did the calligraphy for the entrance of each of the buildings. And you can see it here at the top in Chinese and as well is in Manchu writing. There it is there. Uh, the name of this building is Yanqi Men, which means, whoops, I'm sorry, uh, the gate of inspiring auspiciousness. So the hope is as you enter this, life will become more auspicious. Now, uh, the first thing you see when the doors open is this winding path. And what I love about opening these doors and going into the garden is that you're leaving behind the palace. And everything in the palace is so rectangular. Every, all the, the pathways are straight and um, direct. All the buildings are rectangular. But when you go into the garden, you're suddenly surrounded by rockeries. It just everything is very organic in shape. Uh, and here you go, and you're walking around uh, this, this windy little pathway. And if you look closely and look at the pathway itself, even the stones themselves are not rectangular. They're shaped in triangles and all sorts of uh, a variety of different shapes. Uh, and as you go in, uh, you, you come into a courtyard. And this is the first courtyard of the garden. There are, in total, there are actually four courtyards. And we'll be walking through each one of them. You come into the first courtyard, and what do you see? The first thing you see, really, besides the rockeries and the buildings, are trees, these magnificent old trees. Now, when the Qianlong Emperor first surveyed this space in thinking about his garden, there were some beautiful old trees that had been um, in, in this area of the Forbidden City. Uh, they probably were already several hundred years old. The Forbidden City, you recall, was built in 1420. So it's possible that these were even there from that period. The emperor loved old trees, like every good Chinese literati. And he said, these old trees have to stay. So. This is a tree. If you look, there's a little red marker on it. And as you go through the Qianlong Garden, you'll see various trees with these red markers. And that means that these were the ancient trees that the Qianlong Emperor designed his garden around. Now let's go through this little walkway here. It looks like we're about to go into a cave. Um, go in there, and what do we see? We see this wonderful staircase that's built into the rockery. And you can't really go up there today, but um, we're going to take you up there because it's just a little dangerous. But um, if you climb behind the guardrails, you actually can climb up. And uh, <laughs> you, you, you go up to the top. And you come to this beautiful terrace. Uh, it's got these wonderful marble surrounds. And this is called the Terrace of Collecting Morning Dew. So, so what is that about? So there was a belief that if emperors drank morning dew, that they would live longer lives. And remember, this was a garden for his tranquility and longevity. And so obviously, he wanted to live a long time. And so this was the terrace where they could collect the morning dew. Um, this wasn't just his idea to create this. 
This was a way of his showing off his knowledge of Chinese classics and Chinese history, because there was a garden in the palace of the Han Dynasty emperor, and that Han Dynasty emperor also had a terrace for collecting mountain dew, uh, morning dew. So this was a, a historical and literati reference. And, and just like in Chinese poems, Chinese paintings, people made historical references. He was also making historical references in his garden. So if we climb on, like we're not supposed to do, on top of this terrace, and we look down, we look down into the first courtyard. Um, and as you can see, it's filled with blossoming flowers on this day. And I'm sorry, just want to point out, we're going to go into this first building that we're looking down into. And you can see that it has a little waterway in there. And here we are. Um, and this is just an exquisite object, in my opinion. And, and what is it? Uh, this is another historic and literati reference. And what the reference is, is to the year 353, uh, on the third day of the third month. The third day of the third month was a important Chinese holiday for cleansing oneself and having ritual cleansing. And people would often go to waterways on, on this day. So in the fourth century, in the year 353, there were a group of men poets and literati and scholars, and they all went to a little stream in southern China in the town of Shaoxing, or outside the city, uh, in bamboo groves. And they all sat along this stream, and they had their servants float cups of wine down the stream. And wherever the cup of wine banged against the bank, the person closest to it would have to drink the wine and write a poem. And at the end of the day, they had about 46 different poems. And they turned to the oldest amongst, them, amongst the group, a man named Wang Shizhi, and said, would you write a preface for all of these poems? So Wang Shizhi, in a slightly inebriated state, sat down and wrote, wrote a preface. And the name of the place where they were all sitting was called the Orchid Pavilion. And the name of this preface is the preface to the poems at the Orchid Pavilion. And this piece of writing became the most famous piece of calligraphy and the most loved piece of Chinese calligraphy in all of Chinese history. So today, anybody learning calligraphy, really the first thing you have to do is sit down and copy the Orchid Pavilion preface. So everybody knows this piece of writing. There was an emperor in the Tang Dynasty who so loved this piece of writing that he sent one of his servants out to basically steal it from the person who owned it. Uh, after it came to the palace, he had other people copy it. He had it engraved in stone. And then when he died, he actually buried the calligraphy with himself. So the original piece doesn't exist anymore, but there are many, many copies of it. And. Uh, after Wang Shizhi had created this wonderful um, preface and this piece of writing, many people wanted to remember that event. And so they would make these waterways. And the waterways would be an imitation of the stream where all these literati sat down. And people would reenact uh, this event. 
And so the Qianlong Emperor wanted to have one of these as well. And it was both a way of showing, um, again, how much he respected the Chinese literati system. So uh, let's look at some of the other uh, pavilions that the Qianlong Emperor also created in other of his gardens around Beijing. These are three of them, and you can see these all today, except for the one on the left. It still exists, but it is in the western half of the palace area where all the top officials live today. So uh, it's where Mao lives, so nobody's allowed in there, which is why we only have an old photograph of it. Uh, this is another one that barely exists anymore today. This was created by the Qianlong Emperor's father. Uh, and archaeological excavations have revealed other of these um, waterways. This is from the Song Dynasty Palace in Kaifeng. And uh, in various towns around in China, uh, other gardens have been excavated, and they found other of these waterways. So they're, they're all over the place, um, and they're really wonderful objects. Uh, and in Japan today, they actually still reenact the whole event on the third day of the third, uh, third month of the year. Uh, there's a garden in Kyoto where they dress up as the Chinese literati and write poetry sitting by a bank. Um, OK, so here we are in the pavilion sitting by our brook. And if we look beyond the railings of this pavilion, we see another old tree. And that is a catalpa tree. And it's, again, one of the trees that was uh, already extant in the garden before the Qianlong Emperor built the garden. Um, and he, he loved this tree so much. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a catalpa tree or experienced a catalpa tree in bloom, but it is the most fragrant smell that um, I know I have a catalpa tree. My neighbor has a catalpa tree. And when it blossoms in June, the whole neighborhood has this amazing aroma. So the Qianlong Emperor was very dedicated to this catalpa tree. He wrote poems about it. And he built a pavilion in honor of the catalpa tree. So uh, this is the Catalpa Tree Pavilion. Uh, it's open on all sides, so when you're sitting inside, you can still smell the fragrance of the tree. Uh, and at the same time, have these wonderful views that are framed by the, by the pavilion's openings. Uh, and if we look north, uh, we see more doors heading to the second uh, courtyard. And when those doors open, what do we see again but more rockeries? We're not going to see buildings. We're not going to be thinking about politics or meetings with officials. The Qianlong Emperor really just wants to be thinking about rocks, about mountains, and cultivating his mind. So he can step into the second courtyard um, and this is a building called Sui Chu Tang, the Hall of Fulfilling Original Wishes. Uh, before we go in, if we walk around this courtyard, we'll see four rocks. Now, uh, rocks in China were loved and collected, particularly beginning in the Song Dynasty, which was really uh, the beginning of literati culture. And what was the passion for rocks? It was a passion for um, expression of nature. Um, people loved rocks just as much as they loved paintings and calligraphy. They were really on equal, uh, 
equal standards with, with painting and calligraphy because they had such uh, emotional expression. And sometimes uh, Europeans or Americans find it difficult to think about rocks. But if you think about, for instance, a de Kooning sculpture, I think that's the best way to think about rocks for, for us. Um, there, it's abstract expression. It's appreciation for abstract expression, as well as thinking about nature and being in the mountains. Um, the Qianlong Emperor loved these four rocks, and he had uh, each one of them on, put onto a pedestal in this courtyard. Uh, here's one of them again, just by itself, as a beautiful abstract sculpture. So this is Sui Chu Tang. Uh, it looks like a simple building. Um, but we can actually begin to get a sense of what it looked like when the Qianlong Emperor was uh, in it from this painting, this wonderful painting that's still in the Palace Museum. The, the painting is called 10,000 Countries Come to Pay Tribute to the Emperor. Uh, and in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see people from 10,000 different countries who are coming to pay tribute to the Qianlong Emperor. Here they are. Uh, if you get close to this painting, you can actually study and figure out where all these different people came from. There are even uh, Americans and Europeans, as well as Indians, and people with all different costumes here coming to bring the emperor all sorts of uh, very special objects from their, their home countries. Uh, here we go. You can see many different costumes. Okay, so where in the Forbidden City is this painting? It's actually at the entrance of the Palace of the Tranquility and Longevity. And it must have been painted after the Qianlong Emperor abdicated, after he resigned from service and was theoretically living in this Palace of Tranquility and Longevity. To tell you the truth, he never lived, lived there, he never spent a night there. Because after he resigned and let his son take over, he didn't really trust his son for being a ruler of China. And so he stayed in the same building as his son on the western side and just used this uh, for entertainment. But uh, here he is, uh, and here we are uh, entering in this painting down at the bottom, the entrance of the um, Tranquility and Longevity Garden. And you can see right in this painting the entrance to the Qianlong Garden, um, back there about in the middle on the left side. And if we get a little bit closer, we can see that the Qianlong Emperor is sitting in Sui Chu Tang, sitting right there um, in this building um, that we see here. And so there he is. And I love this picture because it really gives a sense of what the buildings looked like at the time when the Qianlong Emperor was living in it. You can see, um, you can see he's dressed in a formal dress. It must have been New Year's. It's winter time. Uh, I can show you later. There's some images. There's snow around. He's holding one of his grandsons. He's with some of his officials. One of the officials is carrying him a cup of tea. Uh, inside uh, the room, you can see uh, there's a large burner that would have been filled with either coal or wood to keep him warm. There's a beautiful rug on the floor. It's blue and white. It uh, has blue and white medallions on a red and yellow background. Uh, and as I've been going through the Qianlong Garden, you can still see remnants of some of that rug there. Um, behind, on the table, there's, there's a bronze object. And behind that, there's a table with books and painting scrolls there. So again, he's showing to everybody that he is a Chinese literatus. Uh, another nice thing about this painting is that it's probably supposed to take place in the evening because you can see all the lanterns are um, lit up. 
uh, and, and behind, you can see in what is the third courtyard, the rockeries. This is a wonderful, enormous kind of maze of rockeries, whereas the, the second courtyard is quite empty. The third courtyard is filled to the gills with rockery, and you can see the snow on top of it. And I'm going to take you through into that third uh, area, third courtyard. And you see um, on the right, you can see that there's buildings again all up around the rockeries. And we're going to go into one of the buildings. This one here is called the Building of Extending Delight. Now, when you stand inside and you look out, you can't see any views. All you see are rocks. Um, which is really magnificent because you really feel like you're deep in the mountains. Uh, in this building of extended delight, if you turn around, you see that inside all of the lattice work is infilled with porcelain porcelain pieces that were specifically made for this lattice work. Uh, if you look at the pink in this particular detail, that pink color did not come into China until the 18th century. It came from Europe. So this again is the influence of the Jesuits on the imperial court and on the uh, imperial artisans doing doing the work there. This is the first and only place in the whole palace where porcelain is used for decoration. The, the Qianlong Emperor, as this, this might look to you like traditional Chinese architecture, but in fact, the Qianlong Emperor really was interested in cutting edge technology in architecture and decoration. And this room was the cutting edge. This was the first time this technology and this form of decoration had been used. And it's really a, a beautiful space filled with um, these porcelain pieces. Uh, there you go. You can see how detailed each one of these pieces are. So each one there is just about this big. So if you can imagine a whole walls covered with these porcelains. Um, so we're going back now into the rockeries. Uh, these rockeries, you can walk over the rockeries. There are little bridges in them. And you can also walk through the rockeries and through the grottoes. Uh, and if you look up, you'll see that there's a little pavilion at the top there. And then if you stand, and there we see the pavilion again in this wonderful painting. Um, and if you stand at the pavilion and you look down, you see this wonderful little building. And this is actually one of my favorite buildings in the whole garden. And it's called the Bower of Three Friends. So who were the three friends? Uh, every good Chinese literatus knows that there's a group of three friends who are called the Three Friends of Winter. And they're pine, bamboo, and plum blossom. And what's special about the pine, bamboo, and plum blossom? Pine and bamboo stay green all winter long, and the plum blossom flowers in the middle of winter at Chinese New Year times. So these are the Three Friends of Winter. And they symbolize the upright official, the official who can stay upright in any circumstances, even if a government is corrupt or if there is um, uh, various uh, chaotic situations. This is the upright official. And so Three Friends of Winter was a symbol of upright officials. And the emperor decided to name his building after the Three Friends of Winter. And when you go in, you'll see that all the decoration within this building is based on the Three Friends of Winter. Images of plum blossoms, pine, and bamboo. This is a 
Moongate, and it's made out of bamboo, jade, and zatan, which was the, the most revered wood, precious tropical hardwood in China at that time. And they used the wood and the jade to create a image of the three bamboos, uh, the three friends of winter. I just want to show you up close what the background of this moon gate is. This is another cutting edge technology that the Qianlong Emperor wanted to use, and he uses it throughout the buildings. Um, it's bamboo thread marquetry. What they do is they take bamboo, uh, they slice it into these teeny, teeny threads. They dye some of them, and then they put them back together into these uh, wonderful geometric patterns to be backgrounds. And uh, we'll see it later on in other pieces of architecture as well. Uh, this is a wonderful window. It's, it's carved wood, uh, again, depicting the three friends of winter. And right now it's blocked off, but originally when the Qianlong Emperor would have been there, there was a big sheet of glass behind it. And you look through the glass and you could see the rockeries outside. So it was really wonderful. And uh, again, more cutting edge technology, glass. Glass was imported from Europe and we can see in the Qianlong Emperor's notes, he says, we need glass for the, um, for the Qianlong Garden because he wanted to be able to be inside his pavilions and look outside. Traditionally, it would have just been covered with paper, which was opaque, and he couldn't look out. Uh, and he just loved this idea of, of glass that he could look through. He loved it so much that he actually wrote a poem about it. Um, <laughs> So uh, this is a, a screen that was inside this pavilion as well. It had a pair of matching chairs and again depicted in hardwood, glass, and jade, the three friends of winter. Let's go back into the rockeries. And I'm going to take you into a Buddhist space. Um, the Qianlong Emperor was a very serious Buddhist. Uh, he practiced primarily Tibetan Buddhism. And when he made his garden, he made many shrines and caves and grottos where he could meditate and cultivate himself. Uh, and someone had given him a present of these jade and lacquer panels that created a large screen. And what are they depicting? They're depicting the 16 Lohans. Lohans were disciples of the Buddha, direct disciples of the Buddha, who themselves became enlightened. And, um, these screens are actually modeled after paintings that were done by <clears throat> a Tang Dynasty monk artist named Guan Xiu. And the paintings, since they had been done in the Tang Dynasty, were stored in a temple in Hangzhou. And the Qianlong Emperor went to the south and he went to Hangzhou and he went to this temple and he requested to see the paintings. And he was so excited about these paintings uh, that he wrote poems about them. What else, right? Uh, the monk was so excited that the Qianlong Emperor had written the poems that he decided to have the images of the paintings carved in stone and then mounted around a larger uh, stele uh, inside the temple. And these are still there. And in addition to the paintings, he also had Qianlong's poems carved, of course. So you don't want to forget the emperor's poems. 
Uh, and people then started making rubbings of these, of these stones, and the lacquer and jade works were then done in imitation of the rubbings, and they included the Qianlong Emperor's poems right in the upper right-hand corner. And so that's how these jade panels came to be. Uh, the Qianlong Emperor loved these panels. They were given to him as a present, in fact, uh, so much that he decided he wanted to install them in the Qianlong Garden. Uh, this is just one of my favorite ones, and it reminds me of the Qianlong Emperor um, wanting to meditate in his grottos. Um, so he put them in, in the garden in a building called Yanghe Jingshe, Supreme Hall of Cultivating Harmony. And he put them into this nook. Uh, and I'm sorry, this is a photograph that was taken after we had taken all of the panels out of this area. Um, so he, he put them all up against the walls of this nook here. When we removed them, we discovered a surprise. The back of these panels were painted in lacquer and gold. Um, and the Qianlong Emperor had been so excited about the Lohans that the back of the panels just didn't interest him. Uh, and so he had hidden them. And so what you're seeing now is something that had been away from light for over 250 years. Um, and so this is what um, this is what gold lacquer looks like that's never seen the day of light, the light of day. It's really quite something. Um, so I want to take you next downstairs. And this is a beautiful, again, a little meditating nook for the Qianlong Emperor. The, the opening is in the shape of a lotus, uh, a blossoming or a, a lotus bud about to blossom, which was a symbol of Buddhism and enlightenment. Um, and what I'm going to do is we're going to stop for a minute right now and want you all to um, take a break. You can make believe that you're the Qianlong Emperor sitting in your meditative nook there, or you can just get up and stretch your legs, uh, and then we'll continue. Great. All right, so we're going back into the meditation nook of the Qianlong Emperor. And if we were sitting inside that nook and looking out, what would we see? We would see this painting, and it was a painting made to look like a door curtain. In, in China, particularly in the north, between rooms there are often curtains because it's cold. And so in order to keep the heat into the room, you'll, you'll have a curtain. Uh, and so we're looking out at this door curtain. But in fact, it's just a painting. And the Qianlong Emperor, as I said, uh, was really enamored of the Jesuits' grasp of trompe l'oeil. He loved optic tricks. And so he's got all these visual tricks throughout the garden. And one of them is this fake door curtain. Um, but if we walk around the other way and we look the other side of the door curtain, we see another door curtain over here uh, on the left. And to the right of that, we see this wonderful mural. And again, it's a trompe l'oeil mural. This is it here. Um, and he's using European perspective. Uh, and it's just uh, this wonderful, wonderful details in this painting. And again, it's using Chinese materials and uh, Chinese themes. It's meant to be a Chinese space. And in fact, the wallpaper in this uh, non-existent room is the same as the wallpaper in the actual 
room. Um, but just let's look up close. It's got this wonderful image of plum blossoms, um, symbol of spring and, and New Year's and a beautiful vase that they're sitting in. You can see the painting that's, paste, that's, that's hanging on the wall. Um, Castiglione, just to give you a sense of some of the other things that Castiglione did, this is a massive painting. Again, you can see uh, how he mixes the European as, and the Chinese painting styles together and the extreme realism that he introduced. Unfortunately, uh, Castiglione had passed away by the time the emperor had designed this space, but the emperor uh, had instructed Castiglione to please teach some of his uh, other court artists how to paint using the European method that Castiglione had invented. And so the, these were Chinese artists that were painting these paintings. Um, just to see some other trompe l'oeil that was uh, happening in the emperor's court. Uh, these are actually both porcelain, and they were made in the imperial kilns in Jingdezhen. The one on the right obviously is made to look like stone. The one on the left is made to look like lacquer, but they're both porcelain. So the, the Qianlong emperor just loved this visual trickery thing. Uh, we are now going to go north a little ways into a building that was called the Bower of Jade Purity. Half of it was a Buddhist shrine and half of it was just another space for the emperor to enjoy objects and sitting and drinking tea. And in there is another wonderful trompe l'oeil mural. This one's on paper. The previous one was on silk. Again, you can see the wonderful wallpaper uh, on on the wall here within the, whoops, within, within the non-existent space, uh, on the walls as well as on the ceilings. And in the room itself, they also had the same wallpaper on the ceiling as well as the wall. So it really felt like the painting was an extension of the room. So, so what are, are we looking at? Uh, we're looking at a room in a palace with palace women. And you can see that the room is decorated with these wonderful architectural features uh, with paintings on the architectural features. And if we look up close, we can see some of these wonderful paintings. And each one is actually signed by a different court artist. So even though the whole painting was conceived of by one court artist, uh, all the other court artists took part in this and, and signed their names on this wonderful painting. Uh, another little wonderful detail in here is that one of the women is looking at her own reflection uh, in one of the screens. So we know that those screens were meant to look like very, very shiny lacquer. Uh, and, and here you can see her looking at her own reflection. Um, again, this is something that does not usually appear in Chinese painting at all. Um, so again, it shows an influence of European art. Now, going outside the Bower of uh, Jade Purity, we go into this building here, which is the tallest building in the whole Qianlong Garden. It's called the Fuanggu. Uh, it's, it's very high, and you might remember it from the painting. It's in, in the big painting we saw. And in the painting itself at the base, you can see all of Qianlong Emperor's ladies lined up there. So they were part of the celebration uh, that was happening that day on New Year's when this painting was done. Uh, and you can also see some of the children in the foreground and they're lighting firecrackers uh, for the New Year. Uh, but let's go into Fuanggu. Uh, it's four stories high. If you go up to the top of the building, uh, there's this wonderful view 
that you have on all four sides. So it was really meant in a way to symbolize the emperor as emperor over all the lands. And so from the top here, he could look out and see um, all of his lands in, in, in the country on all four sides, all four directions. Um, this is the room before it's been conserved. It's now conserved. I just want you to look at this fabulous ceiling. Um, it's, it's what's called a caisson ceiling. It's carved um, out of wood uh, and then painted in gold. It's still in fantastic condition. Uh, and just to get a little bit a uh, sense of some of the furniture that's in this room, um, it's very, very fine furniture. Uh, this was the throne that was made for the Qianlong Emperor. Uh, you can see some of the details of the carving on the side. Um, I did an exhibition of objects from the Qianlong Garden and included actually was this throne as well as uh, all the furniture in this room. And there's a very, very steep staircase, very narrow staircase, and so we had a problem with how are we going to get these objects out of the space. And what the people at the Palace Museum decided to do was they built scaffolding outside the building. Uh, they attached ropes to all the objects, and they very slowly lowered them down outside. Uh, it was very precarious, but they were sure it was going to work. Uh, this is the beautiful table. Again, it's a Zatan table, and it's carved to look like plum blossoms. It's exquisite. Um, this is the view that the emperor had, and the view that you would have if you came up and looked south. So you're looking back across onto the rest of the Forbidden City. Uh, in the winter time, this is what it looks like. The emperor would have seen the whole Forbidden City covered with snow. It's really an exquisite view. Now, if we go down to the first floor, uh, I'm going to show you some pictures before conservation and also after conservation. Uh, and this is obviously before conservation. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to show you was this beautiful clock. Again, uh, clocks were introduced by the Jesuits from Europe. Uh, the Chinese emperors loved clocks, and they asked the Jesuits to build them a factory uh, within a, a clock workshop within the palace. And it's still there today, and they were able to get this clock back in shape. And, and this one, we know, was actually made in the palace because it says right on it, made during the Qianlong era in Chinese. Uh, this is what that area looks like today. Um, we are slowly working our way through the buildings of uh, the garden to restore them all. And I just want to show you a few more details of the workmanship in here. This is um, just on a beam. Uh, it's carved cinnabar lacquer on the, on the left, that triangular piece. And then the background is lacquer with mother of gold, uh, mother of pearl and gold inlay. So you can see this. It's um, just incredible. And it creates a wonderful sheen. Uh, uh, you can't see this detail because it's so high up, uh, but uh, it just creates a wonderful texture and, and shine in the space. Uh, again, this is some of that uh, bamboo thread marquetry as a background for jade and zatan design. And again, just a, a small little detail in the building. Okay, now we are going to go into Zhuanqin Jai, which is the northernmost building in the garden. Zhuanqin Jai means, sorry, I have to hesitate. It's much easier to say in Chinese. Um, the, uh, the studio for relaxation after diligent service. So. <laughs> 
So what it was referring to is that this was where the emperor would retire after his 60 years of service as an emperor. But it's also, again, referring to a building that existed during the Han Dynasty. So again, he is referring, um, making a historical reference to show off his scholarly knowledge. Now, when you go into this building, uh, it's a very complex building. I'm just going to show you a piece of it. Um, and this is really uh, the, the masterpiece of, of the whole garden. And this is a theater. And it was a theater created for an audience of one, uh, the emperor. And he would sit in this theater. I remember it was winter time. And he would look out. And what would he see would be a mural that covered two whole walls, floor to ceiling, as well as the ceiling. And what was the mural of? It was of a garden. So when the emperor was sitting here, he would feel as if he were in a summer garden, even though it was winter time. And you can see uh, the, wood, the bamboo lattice, but that's actually just painted on. And you see the bamboo lattice on the ceiling as well. And hanging down from it is wisteria blossoms. And it's done in beautiful perspective. Uh, so that it gives you a sense that the blossoms are really hanging down. Uh, and this is just an image of one small detail of the blossoms. Um, but they're, in, they're foreshortened and they change as you get closer and closer to where the emperor would have been sitting so that you get this wonderful sense of three dimensions. Uh, and then, of course, this is wonderful scene of the crane, and the crane again is symbol of longevity and the garden there beyond. I'm sorry, the, you'll also see magpies, and magpies are symbols of happiness. And uh, even today in Beijing, in the Forbidden Sea, you often see magpies flying around, but no cranes, unfortunately. Um, and in addition to the painted bamboo lattice, there is actually lattice, three-dimensional lattice. But because they knew that bamboo would crack if it was in northern climates, they carved other wood to look like bamboo. And then they painted it to make it look like bamboo. So he really has this sense that he's in a bamboo space, but in fact there is no bamboo at all. So take a breath and we are now going to jump forward or backward in time, whichever way you want to think about it. Let's just get to a timeline. Um, 1776 this whole project was finished. And um, the emperor used it a few times, really not too much. But that's beside the point. I think he just enjoyed the process of creating the whole garden, writing the poems, um, thinking about all the cutting edge techniques. Uh, and then when he was finished, he was finished. Uh, and the space was really not used very much for many years until the Empress Dowager Cixi's 60th birthday. And at that point, she decided it was time to renovate the whole palace. And so she um, did re redid the wallpaper. And uh, you, you can see here, this is in Fuangu, that tall four-story building. Uh, she left all the lattice as it was, but she actually took out the paintings in this space. And she added her own paintings. Uh, and she had all of her officials and court artists paint paintings in honor of her 60th birthday. Uh, and if we look at the wallpaper in many of the rooms, we can see that there are actually seven layers of wallpaper. So the wallpaper was being changed over and over. 
Uh, after the Empress Dowager passed away, uh, Pui took over. He was the young boy emperor. Uh, he went on the throne until 1911, 1912, when there was a revolution. Uh, the Manchus were overthrown. The new government said to Pui, well, you can, you can stay here uh, until 1924. In 1923, they said, enough. You're out, you're out of here. Um, and he had to leave. And he, we know, grabbed some things, some things, from the Qianlong Garden, um, but then he was out of there, and the Qianlong Garden just sat there. Um, in the 1940s, early 1940s or late 1930s, um, a woman named Hedda Morrison, who was a German photographer and had a studio in Beijing, she and a friend of hers talked their way into the Qianlong Garden. They had read about it, and they just were dying to see it. And they kept going to the president of what was then already called the Palace Museum and said, we really, really want to go in. And they kept saying, no, 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 no. And the reason they said, no, 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 you can't go in is because it was totally overgrown. There was nothing in there. It was just a mess. Uh, and finally, they said, OK, you can go in. And Hedda Morrison took some photographs. And one of the things that she and her friends said is that when they went in, they could see that it had been totally overgrown, and all the bushes were freshly cut so that there, there was a way for them to walk through the spaces. So we have these wonderful photographs that I discovered at Harvard that Hedda Morrison took. Um, so that, that's Hedda Morrison's photographs. And then in 1949, as we know, there was the revolution, and uh, new people uh, came into the Palace Museum, and they started taking photographs um, of what bad shape uh, the whole palace was in, but it, including the uh, Qianlong Garden. And I came upon these photographs actually in a flea market, and I was thrilled because I recognized exactly what they were. Uh, and they were photographs, both um, before and after photographs. So we know that in 1949, this is what that pavilion looked like, covered with um, tree growth. Uh, this is another, another pavilion in the Qianlong Garden. And then this is the after picture, when they had cleaned it all up. So again, you can see, covered with trees, a mess, probably destroying the structure of the buildings, and then cleaned up. So they cleaned up the, um, the architecture on the exteriors, but not the interiors. The interiors were just left as they were um, until recently. 2001, the World Monuments Fund, which is headquarters in New York, uh, created a collaborative project with the Palace Museum to work on the interiors and conserve and restore the interiors of the Qianlong Garden. And it has been a very, very long uh, and very detailed process. Uh, this is replacing some of the, you can see, very tiny bamboo pieces uh, on some of the lattice work. Uh, a man who worked on this project uh, as a conservator told me that when he first went into Drenchen Jai, the studio um, of exhaustion after diligent service, um, <laughs> when he first went in there, all the little pieces of jade and bamboo had fallen from their places onto the floor. And he put each one in a little baggie and, by the, and marked where exactly it was. And by the time he was finished, he said he had 25,000 baggies. And that was one building. And so they had to slowly, slowly uh, replace each piece. And it's a project that's still going on. Uh, hopefully, it'll be complete by 2020. Um, 
This gives you a sense of what this space looked like before. Um, some work being done on cleaning the cloisonne. Again, another cutting edge technology. Um, cloisonne was not cutting edge technology, but incorporating cloisonne into architectural decorations was absolutely new during the Qianlong period. Um, this was a photograph I think I took last, last October, um, redoing some of the roofs on the buildings to get ready for 2020. 2020 will be the 500th anniversary of the building of the Forbidden City. And so we're hoping to be able to reopen to the public the Qianlong Garden. Um, not all the interior spaces will be open to the public, and they'll only be open to a few people at any one time, because if we had you know, on good days at the Forbidden City, there are 180,000 visitors. And if we had 180,000 visitors or even 100,000 visitors walking into these rooms, uh, in one day they would be destroyed again. So um, we'll be limiting the number of people that go in at any one time, but the plan is for the space to be open. There'll be reservations that can be made ahead of time online to go into the spaces. Um, and this was also taken last, last fall, um, scaffolding, fixing everything up uh, so that it'll be ready for the Qianlong Emperor uh, and he'll feel at home there, but more importantly, it'll be open to all of you to come. And I hope you'll come and visit. Thank you. Thank you.